Good morning, woke AF nation. Good morning, peeps, and a welcome to Woke AF Daily with me, your girl, Danielle Moody, pre-recording and feeling a little under the weather um, from the Brooklyn Bunker. Folks, um, this is a little holiday special uh, that we put together with our old friend, Torre, who has a new uh, online book out called The Ivy League Counterfeiter, and it is at Scribd. Um, you can get the audio version or you can get the... Um, uh, read version of the book. And it's really exciting. Um, I joined Torre and interviewed him on his own show, the Torre show, which you can get wherever you get your podcasts, uh, about his old friend, um, who went to boarding school, got into Columbia university and during his ups and downs through his life became a counterfeiter for six months and ended up in federal prison. And the premise of the book is how does someone who has access to a world outside of his own, uh, the opportunity to go down a path of legitimacy after seeing his own brother end up in the prison industrial complex, how does he decide to do the alternative? And so the book takes, you know, a lot of twists and turns. And this is, you know, someone that Torre knew. Um, and he spent a couple of years interviewing his family members, his old, you know, Columbia University friends, his old friends at boarding school to get a sense of who this person was and why they decided on a life of crime. It reads like a true crime podcast. It is so easy and good, um, and enjoyable and shocking that it's a true story. So folks check out my interview. Uh, this was a cross collab with the Torre show. It aired earlier, uh, with my old friend Torre about his new book, the Ivy league counterfeiter that's coming up next. Torre. Hi. It's been forever in a day. I know. So excited to be back with you. Um, <laughs> the shade. <laughs> so I meant that. excited I to be back with you. So excited. I'm thrilled even. Um, your new book. I, 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 I cannot believe that the Ivy League counterfeiter, your new book, is a true story. <laughs> because it was one of the most, like, outrageous stories that I think that I have read in quite some time. Thank you. And I kept having to go back and I'm like, this is real. This is re like, he knew this man. So I did. Cliff Evans, Ivy league gets into prep school is from the quote unquote hood has two paths set in front of him in his life. One that he knows because we will talk about his older brother, one that is a life of crime that leads as you wrote in the book, two places, it leads to prison or an early death, right? There, there's not a lot of in between there's, that happens no, there's when not you, a lot of when you choose the, just hanging out. Yeah. Right. And then the other life, which you would think, or at least America has told us that when you have an Ivy league education, even if you happen to be black and from the hood, there are lots of opportunities and choices to make money, to make a name, which is what Cliff Evans your former friend really wanted. He wanted to make a name for himself. He wanted to be bigger and he felt that there was only one way to go. I just want to ask you before we jump into like the specifics of the book, what compelled you? It's been, I guess, well, close to almost three decades since he has passed. Uh, since, well, since the, since the story he, came together. He passed in 2010. He's pa Okay, he passed in 2010. The story, this happens mostly in 1996. Okay. But, you know, Cliff was somebody that I remembered 
from high school. He was one of the guys from from school. Not everybody from your high school you remember 20 years later. There might be some people who you went to high school with who come up to you right now. Mm -hmm. Anyone listening right now and be like, I went to high school with you. You'd be like, I don't remember you. Cliff was not one of those people. He was one of those people that everybody who was around him at that time would remember him. He was charismatic. He was kind of larger than life. He made an impact on everybody he was around. And he was a complicated person. And I had just always had it in the back of my mind, like, this is a fantastic story. And I want to tell this story even more deeply. Somebody who found a copier and copied money, photocopied mm-hmm. money. That is not how you do it. Cause I found actual counterfeiters. Mm-hmm. And when I told them his method, they laughed. That's hysterical. That is not how it's done. Found a copier, distributed money all around the city, other cities, and was really going for it. But with counterfeiting, you can't, win, you can only win for a certain period of time. Right. Because the whole idea of counterfeiting is that people won't eventually figure out where the fake money is coming from. Right. So which means that you're moving around to move money all over the place. I mean, to me, as I was listening, it sounded exhausting. It's like counterfeiting (laughs) sounded exhausting as hell. No, you're constantly spending money on small things that you don't really want because you got to keep breaking your fake money to get real money, but you Mm got to do that by buying a hat, a drink, a little sweater, this and that. You don't want to buy anything too expensive because then you're eating up your profits, but you can't buy anything. You can't buy a house. And you don't want to buy anything too expensive because the idea is that then you're getting into places where people are actually looking at the money. One of the things you know, that was mentioned in the book is that as Cliff is trying to, I guess, train his lieutenants, right, in how to move this money, he's saying, well, go to places that are dark where they're really busy so they're not paying attention to what's coming in and what's going out. Um, And so we will move along to the book (laughs) where they decide to $900 at a bank. Like it just, it, I screamed and I was just like, you dummy. Like you somebody, don't, you don't. somebody deposits money into an ATM, and that's where the government really started to figure out um, who they were. See, one of the things they didn't realize, right, the, the, the problem was there from the beginning. This high-end copier that Cliff discovered on the campus of Columbia University, mm-hmm. very expensive copier. He, Puts a dollar bill on it. It comes back perfectly. He told me he immediately saw exactly what he needed to do to make this a business. That copier was putting a code yep. on every piece of paper and made that you or I couldn't see, but law enforcement could pull out their little microscope and go, oh, mm-hmm. now he, the apartment that Cliff lived in, he called the chop zone where they chopped up the money. Mm -hmm. So I imagine the copier was putting a code on a piece of paper and he is unknowingly copying, let's say six bills at once probably. So not every bill had the code. So the police are sort of getting this, they're they're seeing the secret service is seeing these uh, bills, but some of them don't have a code. Right. But some of them do. So they don't even Cliff doesn't even realize which bills he's handing out that are going to sink him and which are not. Um, But yeah, you they one of the actual professional counterfeiters I found compared it to this amazing Richard Pryor movie from the 80s, Brewster's Millions. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you seen this? You heard about these? I would not remember. Okay, because that was before you were born. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're doing that. Yeah, we're doing that. Um, Richard Pryor is given, let's I forget the scale, but like at the time it was like gigantic numbers. He's Mm -hmm. given like, I think it was like $10 million that he had to spend within like a month or something like that. And if he accomplished that, then he would be given $100 million, like far, far more. But he had to have nothing to show for it at the end of the spending period. 
So you can't buy anything. So he's just constantly buying stuff. So like one thing, he he has a room designed and the designer buys, you know, all the fabrics and all the furniture. And he walks in and he goes, I don't know, change it. So then the designer has to completely redesign the room. So now I've just wasted, you know, what, $20,000 on like designing a room, your time, but just do it again. He just keeps doing that over and over again. So he just, what he's just spending money to get nothing. Right. And and it is so numbing. I think we all know the value and the thrill of retail therapy, but at a certain point that would become, mm-hmm. there would be diminished returns. You'd be like, just buying more crap, like all the yeah. time. It's exhausting. And, but he's, but you know, can't go back to the same place twice. So we're spreading in New York and then we're going to Jersey. Then we're going to Philly. Then we're going to, let's just. Just to kind of flood the zone. What is so compelling is that he's addicted Mm. to the hustler life. Mm -hmm. Like he is addicted to this caricature of himself that he's created in his head. Mm -hmm. And you refer to him in the book. You say, you know, he's smart. He's a smart guy. He he got great grades. He goes from Milton Academy, gets into Columbia University. I mean, this is Ivy after Ivy. And so I'm just, you know, you have interviewed for this book, his friends, his family. Talk to him. Talk to him. What is it? Like, what was it about street life, about the underworld that would compel somebody with such opportunity that was in front of you to be like, nah, I want to live. It's like I'm pointing to a mansion and he's like, nah, I want to live in the gutter. Like, I don't, like, what is it? He talked about seeing the hustlers as a young person and when he was young and seeing the sense of power and freedom that they seem to have. I have money without compromising, without sacrificing, without giving away any of my dignity or my, like, I do what I want to do. That image is extremely attractive to Mm. a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Most of us either have a fear that doesn't allow us to go there, or we don't know how to get into that world. Mm -hmm. The people who don't fall into those two buckets can go into that way. You know, I can't blame him. You know, there was a point at which he was one of the biggest weed salesmen at Columbia. And he's thinking about, should I get a job, a regular job? Now, the regular job, you're making, what, $40,000. You got to show up when the boss says. You got to stay until the boss says. You got to talk, take the boss's shit while you're there, blah, blah, blah. Or I could make, like, way more than that selling weed on my own. Like, why, why would I make that? Because eventually you'll cap out. Like, event, like eventually, right? Like that, I mean, that's well, that's see, what we're told. See, marijuana, you can, you can survive that game. You can sell marijuana privately, like underground and, and get out. You can do that. I know a bunch of people who were, I, they sold marijuana. They dipped out without going, right? Like that you can get away with. Counterfeiting. Mm-mm. But the interesting thing about counterfeiting it's very important to the government to stop counterfeiting, mm-hmm. right? We can't have fake money rolling around the economy. No, because right? I'd go to Kinko's every day if that, if that were going to be the case. we don't want the public to think there's a lot of fake money sloshing around because even worse than individuals doing counterfeiting would be the a significant portion of the American uh, public – And the global public thinking that the American dollar is not to be trusted because Mm -hmm. there's a, if people thought there's a one in four chance that your 20 is fake, the American economy could collapse or could have a significant problem. So I think when we see, you know, like a drug bust, the government gets very proud of itself and they display all the money and guns and cocaine on the table. Look, we stopped a $10 million drug. When it's, when it's counterfeiting, they want to be like, we stopped it. No big deal. Nothing to see here. They don't want you thinking there's tons of fake money. You know, one of the guys from the Secret Service was like, the amount of 
counterfeit money in the American economy is like less than 1%. Mm-hmm. Professional counterfeiter was like, no, I think it's more like 3 4 5%. That's a little bit higher. If the average American agreed with that person, we would have a significant problem. So the government needs to stop counterfeiting without us realizing that counterfeiting is as big as a problem as it is. That is it for me today, dear friends on Woke AF. I hope that you enjoyed this little holiday bonus special on Torrey's new book, The Ivy League Counterfeiter. You can get it at Scribd now. As always, dear friends, power to the people and to all the people power. Get woke and stay woke as fuck.